Upload, the weekly program where we talk about the events of the world and upload it to your mind. Today on the program we have Bobby Del Rio. That's right, Mr. Todd Van Allen. Step back and stand by is sarcasm. <laughs> no, it's not. Lewis Taylor. I learned from the debate that I'm on Mars and the air smells like turpentine in the Okanagan Valley. That makes no sense. Oh my God. Yep. My name None. is Andrew Moody and- We've lost our guest. We have lost our guest. <laughs> He's just out here. And for, uh, for on our program today, we have a special guest, somebody we don't even know. I just like literally Googled him and he came on. Thank you, Jake, which is Jake Farr. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only Jake Farr. Hello. <laughs> Uh, welcome. My cheeks welcome. are already hurting. <laughs> Good. <laughs> now, before we get into the debate, because yes, Bobby, we're going to talk about the debate. I know you want to. But Thanks. here's the thing. Uh, Jake, could you tell us just a bit about yourself? Uh, sure. So my name is Jake Farr. I use pronouns of he, him. I identify as a transmasculine person. Um, and uh, my day job is I'm a uh, private social worker as well as I work in community health. Um, and I do a lot of work for advocating for uh, trans health in Durham. And as well in Toronto, I've worked in Toronto for a number of years, uh, did some housing for trans folks. So that's pretty much my life is around uh, supporting the trans community in whatever way I possibly can. Excellent. And that's one of the reasons why I totally invited you here because, you know, as you've, for those of you who've been watching the show, we've been talking about trans issues and JK Rowling. And I was like, okay, I'm a trans ally, but come on, like, you know, let's see if we can actually get the voice. We the know nothing. <laughs> yes. And we well, there was a someone. few moments I was like cringing on some of the comments, but yep. I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we need someone to sort of help to guide us, you know, out of the cringe moments. Uh, so, but we really do have to get into talk about the debate between. Speaking Jeff of Bobby cringing. Speaking, speak, nice. That was a good threat. Segment. Right. Well done, Bobby. Thank you. Speaking of, that, that's Bobby's segue. That goes I'm learning. I'm learning. Um, yeah. So we do need to talk about the debate. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we do need to talk about it. So guys, um, uh, and let's actually, let's start with our guest. A any thoughts? Have you, did you watch it? Did you? <laughs> yeah, of course I watched it. I'm quite, yeah, I, I watched it. Uh, I have uh, family that are American, so it's always very interesting. Um, so yeah, um, I don't even think, I don't call it a debate. I'm not even going to yeah. give it that recognition that it was a debate. I think it was just, well, what did we call it? A shit show? Um, it was nothing. It gave nothing to anybody other than the normal everyday Trump bull crap and Biden just stood by yeah and uh, you know in my opinion yeah and here's the thing because eh? I think a lot of people some people are like oh my god Biden totally lost that I think Biden is just used to a presidential debate and um uh you know, some people, I know Bobby's, Bobby, yeah, we're going to get to you, Bobby. I know. <laughs> we're going to say, like, <laughs> we're like that uh, Trump wiped the floor with Biden. But I also think um, that actually, like, uh, uh, Trump was trying to rally his base. But the, the, what Trump doesn't realize is that debates are for pulling people under your tent. So rallying your base, it's not going to help you if you're the incumbent and if you're in power. And if you're lower in the polls, if you're lower in the polls, he has to get the white women in the suburbs on board. And by saying, by, you know, not saying he's against, you know, uh, racists, that, that's not helping him. But Bobby, what did you think? Uh, I was like, I thought about it for like a day. I was like, what do I think of this debate? And then I, I was like, you know what? I have an analogy, right? I don't know how to make analogies. I'm making an analogy. I, this is what I think the state of American politics is personified by that debate. I was like, and I'm not American, but I will say we, right? I'm, from the perspective of the American people, like, we're all on the Titanic. Biden is gonna give you a hug just before everybody dies. And then Trump is actually building another boat that only half the people can come on if you French kiss his asshole first. This, this to me, is exactly what politics is right now in the United States. Uh, it's, I, it's two two failed, you know, leaders, and you have to pick one. 
Yeah, but the whole thing about, and, and this is the optics of these modern day debates, it's about the circus of individuality. It is not about the realities of policies. What are, what are your uh, parties standing for? It's become a circus of, okay, which, not even the party, which of these individuals am I choosing? I would, adjust your, I would adjust your analogy, Bobby, just really quickly. I, it's not that Trump is building another boat. He's guiding the boat towards the biggest iceberg he can find because his <laughs> iceberg is going to be the biggest iceberg. Well, and here's the thing. Here's, here's the thing. Actually, I think, I think Bobby's uh, analogy does hold because if we know anything about Trump's businesses, the boat is going to push away from the Titanic and sink within three minutes. And then uh, Trump will blame the Chinese somehow. Right. Um, that, I, I got to watch that thing on my birthday. Um, Happy so, birthday. Yeah. Happy. Uh, Happy that was, it was Happy the birthday. worst gift I could have gotten. I almost threw up my Osobuco. Honestly, it was... Uh, <laughs> But, but it, 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 the one thing that I will take away from this is that Biden was able to snap at Trump and say the things that you know, and she has said actually that Hillary Clinton wanted to say to Donald Trump, like, mm -hmm. shut up, you clown. Will you just shut your pie hole? Like all these kind of like lovely little digs that he was doing is like, this guy's an idiot. Like, all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to see someone actually calling him on his bullshit. But like, there, there needs to be... Uh, if the moderator's not going to do it, Biden has to find a way to shut that guy down. And I think the way to do it is ridicule. Mm. It honestly it, is, is the only this way. This is my problem with the debate, right? Is that, yeah. why did we just watch that fucking debate? Because everyone mm -hmm. who came in with a certain set of beliefs about each respective candidate has now left the debate with the exact same perception. Yeah. Nothing has changed, right? Like, I think people on the left are like, yeah, finally somebody told Trump to shut the hell up. And then people on the right are like, yeah, Trump showed everybody how weak Biden is. And it, it's like, I almost don't think you even need debates anymore in the social media age, because we already know everything about them all the time, right? We, we, we've seen a thousand sound bites. We've seen 1,200 videos. We've, like, it's like we've already made up all of our minds. I think what, what really became uh, apparent is for, for whatever side you're on, it solidified what you already knew about your opponent's base. Right. Right. But that's like what I came out of, came out of it with uh, is that Biden really doesn't understand the breadth of his base. Right. He gives lip service to it, but most of his base is not his, uh, it, it's not his constituents, right? It's not the people who put money in his pocket and make America work in a way that he wants it to work. And Trump, uh, it was like, he made it really clear that his base is really angry about the reevaluation of the Western, right? <laughs> And uh, white American myths. Uh, one of the things that, that really hit me, uh, we're living in an age of the techno nerd, right? Where it's the, the technological, um, uh, the, the boys and girls who are on top of technology who are dominating the economy. And for folks coming from a 50s perspective, uh, especially um, a white American perspective of puissance, of physical strength, of dominance through violence, that is a hard pill to swallow. I, I would also add, however, just giving it some more historical perspective, Barack Obama's first debate against Mitt Romney, people thought he lost. Yeah. People like he, he wasn't, he was the incumbent. So he was trying to maintain his base and just trying to, so because he was ahead in the polls. So that's what, as an incumbent, you try to do. You try to not screw up. You try to not say something really stupid. However, as opposed to this debate, I think regardless of what Joe Biden did or didn't do, um, I think uh, Donald Trump's statement about the Proud Boys uh, may uh, come back to haunt him. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, during the debate, the, the debate, Donald Trump was uh, asked to denounce um, white supremacy. And instead of very quickly and very easily saying, 
white supremacy is wrong, which is easy to do, he said, of the, he said, well, what group? Like, what group are you talking about? And the host said, well, the Proud Boys, for example. And immediately, almost as if it were rehearsed, he said, stand by, no, stand down, stand, stand back, stand back, and step, stand step by. back and stand by. Yeah, yeah. Which is interpreted by many people, I think rightly so, that he's, he's saying, you know, you know, don't do anything yet until I get elected and then we're gonna kick some ass. I don't see how this hurts him. He's already said this. This is just Charlottesville 2.0. This is just, I mean, it's, it's just, this is what I'm saying. It's like, everybody already knows this stuff, right? White supremacists are part of his base. Uh, Jake, are you worried at all about an outcome if Donald Trump becomes president? Like, you've got family down there. So are you, are you maybe a little worried about what's gonna happen if he becomes president again? <laughs> so some of my family are Trumpers. Um, oh. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, so at, at least, at, uh, so at least, you know, here's the deal. So I, I know I can, I'm going to take that back. Maybe they're not Trumpers, but they are Republican and they will be right. Republican from the day they, t so do they vote? I don't know if they vote for him, but I mean, they're part of the process, right? So they're right. not voting against them. They're with them, in my opinion. Um, so do I worry? I worry? I worry a lot about a lot of people in the U.S. right now. And the problem is it doesn't just not them. It impacts the rest of the world because this show that he's putting on is, a, is drama. He knows. So the man is knows how to get people like so I'm not saying he's a good president, but he he understands people's psyches in a way that when he riles them, then we talk about it. We give him press. We give him all this stuff which he wants. So what it does is that it spreads it out to the world. So it gives all the people in the U.S. when they travel, it puts them in bad places. It puts them, oh, you're American. It gives people bad negative feeling about that. Even I myself, I'm like so fed up sometimes with the American people. And I'm like, I went to school there. I did, I, I'm connected. And I'm still like, my God, like wake up people, right? And so it's even given me bad feelings. And we already know his stuff. Like for my community, he sucks. Like don't even wanna talk about that, right? But so I just think that like, you know, it's dangerous all over all the stuff that he says and the fact that he didn't stand up and say, I absolutely, you know, denounce anything to do with white supremacy is so dangerous. I think mean, like, so one dangerous. Of the, yeah. One of the things that I, I will say though um, not in Trump's defense, but in uh, looking at how well he played the game and uh, how Biden was somewhat silenced. And that is his critique of the history of uh, the Dems economic policies and what it's done to poor and disenfranchised and the working class in America. They have not always there, it's, it's still a, a fat cat, uh, corporate leaning party. It's like Mary Antoinette uh, is in her carriage and instead of just throwing brioche, she's throwing veggie burgers. At least that's what Trump is presenting that party to be. And that's gonna resonate far beyond just the Republican base. I, I guess I don't understand the moral outrage. I do not understand the moral outrage, specifically yeah. by the left, which most of my Facebook feed are, are people on the left. And I'm not left or right, right? I'm nonpartisan on purpose. I'm out of, you know, sure. I think, think politics sure is, is, is yeah, a game right. of bullshit, right? Like, I think it's just a game of power that, you know, people just sort of conveniently say this or that in order to have more money and set themselves up for their career where they can be a consultant eight years from now, right? Like that, that's essentially what the whole thing is set up to do. And it's like, okay, so if you're on the left and you're looking at Trump, you're like, oh my God, how did he not, you know, condemn white supremacists? How, how, come, he, how come he kept interrupting Biden, right? How come he, it's like, he's a prick. Yeah. This is a brand. He's not just gonna stop being a prick. And then it's like, people think, cause there's a debate, like now he's gonna like, now he's still a brick. What? You know, I wonder if, and, and this becomes interesting for me around um, backroom politics, which is where shit happens, right? Did uh, the Republicans have focus groups on picking the new enemy, right? And I'm sure it was between blacks, gay, 
hey, you know, right. LGBTQ, uh, Hispanics, Muslims. So many options. And I mean, it's like black folk are always on the back burner, but then who are we gonna front, right? And I can just see the focus groups. You know, it's funny, because I think he does have focus groups, but I think also too, this is a personal, I think it's personal for him. And uh, you know, his support of Gavin McInnes, don't forget, like Gavin McInnes is Canadian. The Proud Boys like started by a Canadian guy who like co-founded, uh, what was it? Uh, the, what was that station? You know, uh, anyway, he co-founded this, yeah. this uh, uh, program and uh, he used his platform to create a, an organization of first off all men and secondly brutally racist and violent and anti-semitic people <clears throat> and again don't be fooled and think that this isn't here in Canada like what he's saying it, like stand back and stand by Canadians racist are hearing Canadians They've always been. Crab boy members oh, yeah. are, who are in the military or in the police yeah. force yeah. his message is being heard I think what's really become obvious is uh, as far as the two party stances are concerned is you have elite philanthropy directed at the poor and the disenfranchised by the uh, Dems. And on the Republican side, you have, we have got to return to, you know, what I said before, the Western roots, the idea of the strong Pusian. And, and on one level, when you look at how the Americans established themselves as uh, not only a world power, but as a controller of the world's resources, right? They're in a serious bind right now. Uh, if they do not uh, maintain military strength in a world that is radically shifting uh, 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 across the board as, as far as hegemony is concerned, uh, they're screwed. They have so squandered uh, their resources, a, a, a massive array of resources, uh, that if they don't dominate international markets and international resources, they're finished. They were able at one point uh, to allow uh, some economic progress of, of workers and those they considered, you know, from a corporate elite level, lesser folks, and you know, create this dominance, not dominance, this hegemony. But they're not in that position anymore. So I don't know, Dem or Republican, I don't know how. <laughs> America is is going to survive this. I think that both parties in the United States fund, fundamentally are disconnected from the electorate. I think that most people believe that people are either left or right, and I don't think that's true. I think most people are a combination of the two, right? I think that most people are in the middle, and the middle is very, very, very large, and that's why they go back and forth, right? Otherwise, it would always be Republican or it would always be Democrat. But all the people are in the middle going, oh, okay, I kind of agree with this. I kind of agree with that. And so, like, for example, as soon as the Proud Boys were mentioned, I just went, what are you doing, you idiot? You've now taken this, like, I'm talking about Chris Wallace, right? You've now taken this sort of niche party. I don't even know what, what the hell they are. They're like a sort of newer the vigilante group. group. They are right? the terrorists, yeah. yeah. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and and now you've now given them international press coverage, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. now you validated them because I didn't know who the hell they were before. There's always you know there's it's for me it's just iterations of the same phenomenon, right? It's like like the QAnon or the alt right and Richard Spencer and now Proud Boys. Like if you're just like giving a name to sort of different subsets of the of the same sort of hateful ideology. But now you validated them. So now I bet you increased their membership by times 10. But also too, like they have been gaining, uh, uh, you know, uh, viewership by through people like Joe Rogan, who on his podcast had Gavin McInnes talking about the Proud Boys. Thank you very much. And Joe Rogan is somebody who like, he is somebody who's like sitting right in the middle. He's not right, he's not, he's not Republican, he's not Democrat. However, he is giving voice to people who are offensive. And some of the Spotify employees don't like it and to be honest like you know my attitude to those uh, spotify employees is do suck it up that's like he's making the biggest amount of money spend the biggest amount of money on him let he's going to have to do his stuff but what but 
is that fair, Jake? Like, do you think that that's a fair statement? Wow. Okay, so I believe in free speech, absolutely. But I think when we give speech and, or sorry, we give highlight to those people who are spewing hate, um, that's dangerous. I mean, that's my line is that I believe in free speech. I believe, I mean, you have a right to say what you wanna say. I get to say what I wanna say. But when we start to give platform to people speaking hate against other people, that's where I draw the line uh, as far as I think that it becomes hate speech and it becomes dangerous for people. Okay, but here's the issue. Here's and, the issue, right? Yeah. Who defines the hate? Because it's funny sort of inculcating myself into, into the right mm -hmm. in the last month, to, really just to get that perspective and then just to see like, what is the difference between the left and the right, okay? And the right will, will call mainstream liberal ideas hate speech, yeah. right? Like every BLM protest is is a is an example of a terrorist organization according to the right so and and yet if, and if you look at the sort of demographics of the media consumption fox news and msnbc are are like neck and neck like both like it's not like it's not, the right is not like a niche tiny little cable channel right it, it's it's like you have a bifurcated nation that's completely divided consuming this media that that says the exact opposite message from each other the whole time. Well, you know what? I was going to ask Todd about this because both you and I, we write stuff and we produce things that get out there into the, to, into the public. And we uh, feel very strongly, of course, about, well, I don't know what you feel about free speech. Maybe you hate it. But um, I do want the latitude to be able to say things that people don't like. However... Uh, like, what do you think about like the 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 way people at Spotify feel about uh, Joe Rogan? Like, what what's there? Your there is a there is a huge difference because uh, first of all, Jake, I completely agree with you. Like the you know, yes, you're entitled to free speech, but that uh, ability to say free speech doesn't allow you to yell fire in a crowded theater. Yeah. Right. Um, as soon as other people are going to be impacted um, horribly or violently. Uh, to what you are actually saying is wrong. I also going to look at the um, at the basis of fact, uh, which is why I don't take a lot of credence in Fox News because if you had a fact checker on that, they would five would die before the end of the hour, uh, just by the amount of throughput that they would have to validate. Um, uh, yeah, you. Uh, there, if, if we don't have free speech, we don't have a free press. If we don't have a free press, we don't have an informed uh, electorate. So, uh, in creating and writing yeah uh you have to be able to back up what you're saying and that's why i'm always very careful but whenever i am crafting jokes that may be considered controversial or or tackle a subject that that is it needs some delicate care i try to put that into that so that i'm making sure that all of my bases are covered um you should be able to make uh jokes about anything uh that is out there but what is going to determine whether your joke is, is, is valid and, and right and also funny is knowing how much care you put into it to make sure that the coverage is there, the care is there, that people understand that, oh, I see what is going on here. And the more audacious you can make that, the more challenging that becomes. But that's the, uh, that's the risk and the reward. And I These are not that... jokes. These are not jokes they're making, though. They are calling out to their base. I have a, a comedian friend of mine who actually turned into a, a proud boy. And it shocked me the day that, you know, we, we were all gathered after a show and I went, oh, wow, is everything else dirty in the wash? Because he was wearing the, the gold lemonade uh, polo shirt. He goes, no, I'm a proud boy. And every one of us just spat beer like a, like a spit take. And uh, he's gone. He's gone. Yeah. He's absolutely gone. He has stepped back and he's standing by. Mm. And that's the sad part. One of the things, though, uh, okay, let's let's re-examine the idea of free speech. Uh, there has always been free speech uh, throughout the entire span. I've said this before, throughout the entire span of human history, what there has never been is freedom from the consequences of free speech. So for me, coming from a community, and this is a, a community perspective, and we all come from different perspectives, uh, free speech, has not been gifted to my community. Uh, it is 
It has always been challenged, if not ruthlessly oppressed. Um, I don't carry the idea this, and it's the tone that people bring to this idea of free speech, like it actually um, exists without countering oppression, right? So when I hear uh, people on the right say, and, and I mean, I, I mean the vicious right, say, uh, we will violently react to your oppression of our speech uh, that revolves around us oppressing your voice, then I have an issue. I do not see coming from um, sensible folk on the left, because, you know, there's idiots on the left. Like, you may, the number of idiots in the human race, myself included, is fucking phenomenal. It's, it's astronomical. And most of us, most of the world is conservative. Um, it's a pragmatic approach to take. I don't but now we're mean. entering into a time where I think we have to recognize your freedom of speech to oppress my freedom of speech, in fact, my life, needs to be re-examined. I think that's very true. I think it, what, you're, what you're saying about idiots on the left, is that of course, they're idiots on the right and idiots of the, on the left. Speaking oh, of idiots on the left. <laughs> here we go and free speech, uh, we will talk about J.K. Rowling. Now, here's the thing, like recently writers and actors, including Ian McEwan and Griff Rice Jones, uh, have rallied around J.K. Rowling and the onslaught against her on social media. And uh, I, you know, I actually agree. I think that first off, any comment that I make about J.K. Rowling is not an excuse for anybody to, uh, to spit vitriol or hate or, or threaten J.K. Rowling. I, you know, first off, like, I do like making fun of her book, whatever it's called, Troubled Blood, because I think, I think it's funny that she's a billionaire who's written this book, like, she, her big hit was Harry Potter, and now she's writing under a pseudonym some other little book that's nowhere going to be as successful, and it's a pseudonym, pseudonyms are supposed to be so you never find out who wrote it, and it's like, <laughs> we know you wrote it, like, like, yeah. I don't know. So, I, I totally, so first off, before we, before we get into J.K. Rowling, um, don't burn books. Like, I really don't believe in burning books. First off, I'll tell you why. Unless I don't you have no kindling. <laughs> you have no kindling and Fifty Shades of Grey is just lying there by the fireplace, <laughs> by all means. Here's the thing. No, this is the big reason why I don't believe in burning books. You bought the book. The money goes into her bank account. Why the heck? Like, don't, like, if you really want to, to, to battle someone and what they're saying in the book, then there should be more free speech, which, hey, Jake, let's just, let's get into some free speech here. Jake. Does that mean I can't burn old sneakers? You can burn old sneakers if you want, if you need kindling, sure. Thank okay. you. So Jake. Yeah. I just thought, first <clears throat> off, let's start off with like Trans 101, because I'm sure that there are people in the audience who, you know, I'm sure that they have questions here. There's like, All five I, of them. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> we could do a whole show on that. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure there are people who are just like, I just, I want to be as supportive, but I have some stupid questions and I don't want to ask. So I'm going to ask yeah. for them. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. So first off, Jake, what is a trans person? Oh, okay. Well, so I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So the, the biggest difference that people can't seem to wrap their head around is sexuality and gender, two different things, right? So sexuality, when you think about it on the low key terms, right? Because we're doing the one on one. Sexuality is around who you're attracted to, who you love. So like, who do you go to bed with sort of thing, right? So we'll take it to that. Gender becomes who you go to bed as right? So it's, it's who you are. It's who your spirit is. It's who your inside is. It is your brain, um, your spirit, whatever, however people want to identify it, right? So again, you are born with this. What, what your journey looks like through it is much different for everybody. Um, everybody doesn't know when they're two years old. Everybody doesn't know when they're five years old. Everybody doesn't know when they're 20. I know folks who are 80 years old who went, holy crap, this is 
now I'm getting it, right? So, um, so gender is within us. So kind of like when you look in the mirror and you can look at yourself and you may be like, okay, listen, I don't really like my hair, my eyes, right? And you may not like that, but when you look in the mirror, you go, oh, I was, I came out and someone identified me as being male and I feel male. I, I feel it. That's, that's who I identify with. So for a trans person, that means someone, so that's what you would call a cisgender person. So if you look at yourself and you look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I'm a guy and I was identified as a guy, you're cisgender, you're on the same side. A trans person is someone who looks in the mirror per se, and I'm doing this generalized, um, and they go, oh, wait a minute. I'm being told I'm that, but I don't really feel like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then it's a spectrum. Right, so everybody wants to look at this binary like male, female, but there's a whole spectrum in there. Spectrum of sexuality, spectrum of gender. And I say my kid, um, uh, born female, um, identifies non binary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, non binary, but identifies as being trans. Mm -hmm. It uh, is, yeah. Which confused me because they love dresses. Right, and, and eventually it came to the point of me having to realize uh, that trans is uh, not only physical, right? It's also um, a, where you stand, what you think of your, like it, it's something that starts before, this is for me, what, what I've been, correct me, uh, if I'm wrong, it begins way before a physical transformation. Uh, it's how you perceive the world. Well, it's, no, but it's who you are. It's absolutely, it's your soul. It's who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, what, that's who we are. That's how we identify, right? So we're only identified binarily because that's the way medicine does it, right? So like I always question, like, so I don't know if you all know about intersex people, but that's just a whole other <laughs> issue. I mean, so I'm just saying like, you know, so we identify people at birth as, and you know, we have all these gender reveal parties, which is impossible because until someone tells you who their gender is, you know, so it's a sex identification party. So we get sexed at birth, but our gender is who we are inside, our soul inside. And so, you know, there's a lot of people who are trans who will never ever do anything medically or surgically, um, even expression, but inside they are who they are, right? And so, <laughs> non, yeah, non-binary people, um, folks who identify in the binary, so there's, sometimes there's non-binary masculine, sometimes there's non-binary feminine, sometimes they just identify as non-binary. So it's, it's a whole spectrum. There's yeah. also a political yeah. stance to it, which is don't binary me. Mm. Right, so this is actually, yeah. this is a perfect segue. Uh, uh, we're stealing your job, Moody. Um, but what I actually wanted to ask you, Jake, because you know, I, I think the politicization of the trans community it for me is is like maybe the hottest issue in the world and i don't understand why right so i i will admit that i i enjoy ben shapiro and i enjoy jordan peterson i think they're intellectually brilliant and i think night, that they're, not, they're not as, well, hold i'm on. sorry let me, let me say let me say, stupid, let me say my let me say I'm my, my piece I just okay. had to laugh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Because Go ahead. I think that my I think that my perspective is is complex, and I want to talk to Jake about it. Right. So I I think that Ben Shapiro and, and Jordan Peterson are very very smart, um, you know, pundits, and they have interesting perspectives. But but I think the things that, that they say about the trans community are disgusting. So I recognize that I am very different in them in a very key way and it's because i do agree with a number of things that they say but when it comes to the trans community i don't understand because i look at the things that jordan peterson says i look at the things that ben shapiro says especially ben shapiro they attack the trans community mercilessly which i think is the reason that they are basically despised around the world and if you look at what they're saying about that community it's you know I, I can understand why they're despised because they're saying very disgusting things. And for me, I've never understood um, what the issue is with the trans community. Like, why is it such a political thing? Why is it this? Th it really seems to piss people off. You look at J.K. Rowling and Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson. You have people who can be very thoughtful and intellectual, and then they and they turn into Neanderthals when they discuss the trans community. Why is that? <clears throat> I don't know. Why do you think? 
I think they're just. I think they're just afraid. I mean, I think it's like mm -hmm. you know when you tend to like look at things, pardon the pun, but like in black and white, right? Like you, it's like you've defined your life based on this is the way things are, and the trans community introduces a really interesting series of debates. To be to be honest, the most intellectually stimulating debates that I've seen in a decade about what is gender, what is sexuality, what like it, it really, in a way get you to question the way you perceive the entire world. And I think most people just, they don't want that noise. Let's, you know what, let's go through yeah. some of the top, t like the top hits of like the <laughs> trans myths that I would really love to sort of like, let's just take them down so that we never have to talk about them on this show ever again. All right, <laughs> Jake, you're gonna help us. Okay, so you're gonna be, you're gonna be the, the, the main batter. I'll, okay? do, I'll do the best from my lens, right? Cause I'm yep, only exactly. one trans person. Yeah. So, I'm gonna floss my teeth. Exactly. <laughs> From J.K. Rowling, sex is real. Trans women are not women. <laughs> Knock it down. So let's start wow. with that. That's well, it uh, uh, way, way to give them the easy one first, Andrew. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> but, but you know what? Because people don't understand gender. The problem is that you can understand sexuality. People can understand sexuality and attraction because you can feel it. Because you can feel attraction mm -hmm. from maybe a, a, a love interest to a friend to your puppy, right? You can feel what that feels like. Oh my God, like I have this feeling, right? People have a hard time understanding gender. If you're not, um, if, you're, if you're cisgender, you, you, you feel good in your body. When you're trans, you feel that way in the body. It, it's harder to, to have people understand. So it's ignorance, right? And it is a, uh, a sexualized thing. And this is, why she, this is why she's dangerous is because she's sexualizing genitalia to be your gender. Right. Uh, thank you very much. So le let's go to her next big hit, uh, which is men will become trans women to take over the feminist movement and enter in a women only spaces to assault women. Right. Yeah, Perfect. Take that one down. So she, so in her big long letter, I don't know if you wrote that, that the rebuttal yeah. that she wrote, right? So we clearly see that she has a wounded soul from having at some point in time had some trauma, right? Uh, and I'm going to say probably at the hands of a male, um, a male identified person. She is worried about misogyny, which is, I mean, not on something uncommon and shouldn't be worried about in this world, but she puts that all together. And so what she's saying is that a man who then be, is going to take over in a misogynistic way into a feminine space by doing, by, be, by becoming a trans person, right? Which you don't become a trans person, you are a trans person. Right. So she can't put she she just does not understand that there's two different things. And just so you know, there's really, really no records of vast majority of men dressing up as women to hurt other women. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it's a myth. Absolutely. But except the problem is, is she's so dangerous. She wrote about it in her book, mm -hmm. which then perpetuates that myth. Yeah, I, I the think I get it. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, the thing that gets me about this, and, and I guess it goes back to, to Bobby's point um, about the intelligence of certain folk. Um, I, I've always believed that, that intelligence is overrated and limited to specific zones. Uh, if you look at the history, and, and this is because it's you know, personal for me, uh, the history of racism uh, coming from a Western perspective. Right, and how some of the most uh, considered, you know, culturally brilliant scientists of the 1800s came up with race theories that were fundamentally insane. Uh, but these individuals were considered, you know, icons of brilliance. Um, and I don't see why that would change now. Yeah, I have seen Wait. with so many of my gay, my gay friends have a huge issue with the trans community. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? yeah. So, and I've also seen gay Republicans like th this notion that you know there's there is a defined side that this isn't an organic process that society has to go through where we all have to go, oh, fuck, I'm uncomfortable, and then work our ways through it, right? The way so many, you know, white Southerners uh, in the 60s have had to work through some of their shit, 
Yeah, I agree. Uh -huh. and, to, and I really want to get through these list of myths because I okay, really want to make sure. No, because these are myths that really somebody's got to, and I just want to get through the ones I have here because- And we have a hard out at noon. Yeah, we, and we have a hard at noon. But also too, <laughs> these are things that, that people think that they have to be challenged. Uh, so uh, another myth, there's no reasoning with trans people. J.K. Rowling is the victim of a violent trans lobby who want to destroy people's careers and incite violence. We gonna address that really? Like, are you I kidding know. me? Like, <laughs> listen. So here's the deal. The I I do I absolutely do not agree with this. Uh, our you know R I P J K Rawlings. I I I am not for that. That's not okay. What I say is like, why are we paying attention to her? Right. Yeah. We are not gonna change her mind. Right. We're mm -hmm. we're just not. She is who she is. But what we need to do now is we need to go back and we need to support the trans community. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Support rather than give her more voice. What I, I just think. want to ask, are the tra is the trans community Masons? Are they Masons? <laughs> no, they're not Masons. No, uh, no, of course not. Actually, that's a good question, you know, because my dad's a Mason. And I said ah! to him, now, <laughs> yeah, I have a complicated life. Um, it's <laughs> interesting. So because I'm male, can I join the Masons? <laughs> Right. And the Shriners? Can I ask you a okay. if, if you do, if you do, that's great. Uh, wait, Bobby, you can ask later, okay? Uh, sorry, we have <laughs> to get through this. <laughs> we do have to, because I just want to take care of the because okay. they're driving me crazy. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> and we are going to, Jake, you and I, we're going to solve the internet. We're gonna Dictator. Do okay. Dictator. Okay, so uh, if, tra if, tra if a trans person says that if you don't date them, then that means you're transphobic. So, sorry, say that if you don't want oh. Some people say that, oh, trans people, they tell me that if you don't date me because I'm trans, then you're obviously transphobic. Okay, well, some people are gonna think that, right? And there is that, there is the key in there is, is, is that there is transphobia. But what it is, is that I say, like we're all attracted to who we're attracted to. Yeah. And if you're attracted to a trans person, great. If you're not attracted to a trans person, that's great. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say that that's transphobic as in a statement. Hmm. Are there transphobic people who are maybe dating a trans guy and then they find out that they're trans and they're like, oh shit, no, because, hmm. but is that about being transphobic or is it about the fact that they were expecting other things? Yeah. Okay. And also too, as a, as a black male, uh, what you'll also experience are people who say that they will never date you. But I mean, uh, I, I think so, you cut Bobby off for making I did. it outside. I did. The realm I of the questions right. you want to ask. I know, but I'm running the show. Think of me as Donald Trump right now. Okay, so trans, <laughs> oh, trans YouTube influencers are tricking women into becoming men. I'm not even like that. I'm not even going to give voice to that. That's but it's specifically. This, but this from, is here's what's yeah. here. That's the dangerous stuff that perpetuates. That's why the trans community has like the highest rate of suicide and suicide ideation and self-harm and, and, um, and addictions and mental health. It's not because they're trans, it's because of all that that goes yeah. on that every day we're told you don't exist, you shouldn't exist, you're wrong, someone's yeah. telling you bullshit. So I'm not even yeah. gonna talk about that. That's I shouldn't, I should have actually started this with a trigger warning because actually, even though I wanna oh. tackle these myths, they are really triggering, but this is directly no. from a woman named okay. Abigail Okay, question, Schreiber. question. Yeah. Yes. So look, stick I to just, the question. Yes. My question is very simple, and it ties, it ties all this okay. together. And, and I, I, it's almost just rephrasing something I said before, but I've made it very long before. So this is very short. Why do, why do you think that there's so many people that appear to hate the trans community? Because they're afraid, and they don't understand, and they won't, they won't educate themselves. Yeah. Are you done with your and questions? They, and, and the other thing is, just so you know, hmm. see... Trans people or people who are gender expansive, we can call right. Mm. They've they were around long before we settled this country, my friends. Okay. And then when the colonizers came, they said, "Oh hell no, we're only doing binary, and you all have to get to figure that out, right?" And so yeah. it's only been since like in the last you know couple of decades, really, like well maybe more than a couple of decades, that you know that our two spirit folks are coming and saying, "Oh, we're actually recognizing them again as being extra special, not as being the you know the downtrodden." So, yeah. I mean, this whole thing has been around for the start of time. The fact is, is that our, our settlers, our Europeans went into a binary. I agree. And ultimately, the, what I want to say to people like Abigail Schreer and to, you know, Jordan Peterson and all these people are, look, um, the, there's nothing you can do. Like, I kind of want to ask them, like, what's the end game? 
Like, what is the end game for them? Like, what like, do you care? Yeah. yeah. Like, like, what What do you care about? Like, what? what yeah. is so bad that you have to have a, a say about someone's life? Yeah. Okay, the one uh, point I want to make, though, um, mm -hmm. uh, about your question. Well, I'm sorry, you're not going to get to the end of the list, dude. <laughs> well, you know what? So, um, yeah. the, the thing that gets me, uh, like, when, when you make the, the question of dating, are you transphobic? If Well, yeah, you are, but we're all transphobic. We're all racist. We're all sexist. We're working through it. Right? Like, I don't know anyone from any, as a black person, I know I have racism against black folk. I know I have sexist issues. I know all of that shit and I'm working through it and I don't know anyone. And I, I'm sorry, I'm putting that out. I don't know anyone that is not all of these isms, right? Mm. It's what you do with them. Yeah. Right. And, I agree. And ultimately, I, this is going to be a harder question, and I'm really looking for your, 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 your wisdom on this one. And it's the, <laughs> the people who bring up, the anti-trans people who bring up detransitioners, the oh, detransitioning right. men and women. Um, uh, because they say, well, you know, you know what they say. They, they say yeah. all kinds of anti-trans stuff to say, oh, yeah. look, see, they're detransitioners, so therefore. Okay, so I'll speak to that only, only from like, so from the lens and what my information that I know, right? Mm. So anything that I've looked at, there's less than half a percent of any person who decides to take on uh, medical or surgical um, transition and um, about half of a percent. But, there, but just remember, there's other reasons behind that. So I know people that have had to stop taking their hormones, so technically detransition because of medical reasons, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Those are all included even in that half a percent, mm -hmm. right? So yes, there are people who have what we call, I don't call detransitioning, I, I call that journeying past and going through the transition and people call detransition. Um, one, one of the big ones is, is because they are, they are held at such like a, a disgrace within their community and within their family that the pressure of being who they are and transitioned is so great that it's so ugly that they actually say, great, I'll just go back to what I was and you'll get off my butt. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's an emotional thing that they're saving themselves, right? And there are a few out there, I'm gonna tell you, I know a few that have done it for the, the press, that have done it for the notoriety to say that I detransitioned and I was screwed. And then there's some people with mental health. So there are some people that we, the people can say they detransitioned, but there's a whole bunch of reasons yeah. within that half a percent half of a percent. Mm. This is something that gets to me though. And, 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 and again, all our realities are constructed around our experiences. So I'm coming from Absolutely. my experience. And that is what I equate this to is the threat uh, that black Americans have always posed in the States uh, from a conservative uh, white perspective um, when they're 13% of the population. It's, it's impossible for black Americans to be an actual threat to white America. And I'm looking at the trans community and there's no way you even come close to 13%. What's the, like, it's insane. It's almost at a level of cowardice to define trans people as a threat, uh, knowing that you can crush that community in a second. Right. And I'm coming from a black perspective where they've done that, where that's happened to the black community. And I can see it happening to the trans community. So well, this is yeah. this is what I mean by endgame. Like the, the problem I don't think JK realizes is that what happens if you continue this speech is that you embolden people who eventually their end game is creating a ghetto. Their end game is putting a tattoo on you. Their end game is is like what has happened to black Americans, hanging you from a tree. That's, there are people out there whose end game is to annihilate you. And so you have to not, uh, what I want JK Rowling to do is to stop talking, to talk to a trans person within the trans community. Mm. And it won't help, it, it won't help. So, so here's what, so the perpetuation for what she does is because in our society, so, uh, you know, I, I, I get a lot of privilege because I pass every day, mm. pass every day as a male in our society because I meet societal standards. When trans women, <clears throat> you know, sometimes 
decide to medically transition or, or, or and later after puberty, their, that testosterone that that ran through their body earlier sets a stage for some things that cannot change very often unless they're very rich and they can get lots of surgery. So the world still sees them and, and we have perpetuated sex worker, mail and address, cross-dressing. And so what happens is, is what it does is when she puts that stuff in a book like that, it perpetuates the fear mm. of the trans women, really, right? It's really never about the trans men. It, the trans women, it, it fear and perpetuates our, our, and our disgust around sex work, which is like a whole nother topic. So what it does is that she just perpetuates stuff in, and she has a huge voice. So now she has this following that reads that and now people think, oh yeah, so trans people are the people that are gonna dress up and they're gonna kill people like in this book. That's the danger in her voice, right? Oh, She's not gonna change. Well, she can I, say, I don't care about her. Yeah, can I say the, what, what's so. crazy about that is that she had so many supporters, of, uh, trans supporters in her community following Harry Potter. Yeah. I don't know why she, I don't know why Can she I does. say though that what, what it shows for me is that almost on a species level, we are traumatized as a species, that trauma is almost universal when you look at, and when you look at trauma, and I have enough in my own life uh, to, to know that when you're traumatized, if something, you see a threat, you strike at it. And I think that we are so, as a, a, I'll, I'll speak to our culture, um, I see trauma all around me on all sides, and I see people striking out all over the place. And man, that's, we have got to do something about our cultural trauma. That's, I just think that's why I wanted to do the show. Credit. That's exactly why I wanted to invite Jake on. And Jake, thank you so much for coming on. I think it's really you. important. Your voice has been so great and has been so valued. And uh, and you know, hey, let's time let's have you on just to talk about like nothing having to do with trans people. How about that? Would that be okay? Wow. Okay. okay. That I was weird. <laughs> before we wrap, before we wrap, I do have a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we do need to promote the voices that are helpful and not the ones that are hurtful. This is why I'm going to go back to Ben Shapiro, the brilliant mind that said, hey, if the coasts uh, flood because of global warming, why don't the people in New York just sell their houses? To whom, motherfucker? <laughs> um, uh, and, you go to uh, Harvard Law School. I, I mean, I what think... A, well, oh, he's stupid. Um, uh, uh, Jake, uh, a, a lot of the talking points that you you made today, I uh, because of work, I I uh, took a uh, trans and LGBTQ um, uh, course in recognition, and and that helped me a lot understand uh, a lot about the communities. And I was it was happy it was happy for me to to hear those being validated by you. So thank you so much for for coming on and doing that. I do have one question about the, the mirror analogy. I love that idea. I'm going, Ben. I, I didn't say anything for five fucking minutes, okay? I know. Um, there you go. Um, there you go. Uh, so now I gotta go wrap them in. Uh, Jake, uh, so the, the mirror, uh, the looking in the mirror thing, I, I love that analogy. I have one question just uh, from a personal standpoint. When you look in the mirror and, and you first say, oh, this fucking guy again. What is that? Is that anything? Is that, <laughs> so, that's my morning. That, yeah. <laughs> that's just you being you and just okay that's it, right? all right yeah. okay. i just want to just want to make sure okay yeah right. i just want to say it feels like bobby's been silenced <laughs> well i'm not I, i mean i'm just taking a lot in right i just I think know. that oh, yeah. but look I, I think i i also think that jk rowling is being given too much credit because i think i personally think her main motivation is to capitalize on the the, the trend of trans people getting headlines eviscerating them because they're such a tiny percentage of the population. You're never going to touch her. And then she's just leveraging that to sell all of her fucking books. Like to me, that's all she's doing. I agree. And you know what? We are not going to help her anymore. So that's it. We're done with JK Rowling yeah. as we're done with this show. So thank you very much for watching. Jake, thank, thank you, you very much for being on here. And yeah, yeah we'd love you. to see you again where we never, we will never talk about JK Rowling again. Okay. Yep. We right. talk about Mars, Mars baby. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're on Mars. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care, and we'll see Thank you, you next week.